Welcome everyone to the session that is forming part of Renew's Green Rebuild Toolkit Beyond Bell Project. My name is Dr. Rachel Goldlust and I am the sustainability researcher here at Renew. I begin our session this evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the respective lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Renew is committed to honouring Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and sea and their rich contributions to society. I also recognise that we have people tuned in from all over the country today from a wide variety of traditional lands. Tonight's focus is on budget-friendly bushfire resilient design and is the first in our Beyond Bow series, which is running each Monday night for four weeks. There'll be further opportunities in subsequent sessions to talk about innovation, vegetation risk and earth-coupled resilient design. In this series, we're featuring 12 case studies as part of our ongoing work to support communities rebuilding after bushfire. Each case study has resilient design elements and building practices that extend the understanding of best practice beyond the complicated and variable bushfire attack level rating or BAL rating system. The Beyond BAL project has been generously funded by grants from Global Giving and the federal government's Black Summer Bushfire Recovery Grants Program. Tonight, we'll be showcasing three bushfire resilient homes in detail and talking to those who designed them. There'll be a short presentation on each case study, followed by a discussion with our expert, Nigel Bell, and the architect involved. They will try to answer any questions you may have about the case study, but we may not get to all of your questions. In the last half an hour, we will bring the full panel together to discuss budget-friendly bushfire resilient design, and I'll be putting your questions to our panel. During the session, you can put questions into the Zoom's Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. You can also use the chat window on the bottom right of the screen to make general comments or to contact our behind the scenes, scenes team with any problems. This webinar is being recorded and will be put up on the Green Rebuild Toolkit website for sharing later. So let's get started. First, we have Imogen Pullar from Imogen Pullar Architects presenting on the Jackie Winter Waters case study. Imogen strives to design simply and directly for the fundamental aspects of life. Every step of her process is guided by efficiency of energy, carbon, space and cost, ensuring she improves upon the past and creates healthy futures for inhabitants and the environment. Imogen's philosophy is to prioritise quality over quantity. Over to you, Imogen. Okay, so I'm going to show you through Jackie Winter Waters. Um, this is a small footprint retreat for one to two people and it can sleep up to five people. The success of this project comes from the efforts of many people, um, some of who are listed here, who I'm truly grateful. Um, so the property is located on the land and waters of the Bunurong and Gurnai Kurnai people of South Gippsland, which is two and a half uh, hours southeast of Melbourne. Walkerville North is a small township of mostly holiday homes and the property is located at the very end of the single road in and out and accessed by a dirt track that winds through the bush um, behind three other properties which is shown here um, in yellow out here. Um, the site has unmanaged forest uphill to the west and the north on this side, looks like this. And then downhill, um, 100 metres downhill is Waratah Bay um, and it has commanding views over Wilson's Promontory in the distance. So more than two thirds of the site is deemed flame zone, which is shown in the pink here and we'll, with the remaining southeast corner being Bow 40. So this is our, where we could build our building. Um, it also happens to be the steepest part of the site, which is quite a challenge for this low budget project. And so we've located the um, house as far up on the hill as we can to capture the views, but we're still within the Bow 40 zone. So to mitigate the steep terrain, um, we created an outdoor platform um, for living on, which is a large 70 square metre deck, and that wraps around three sides of a 30 square metre building. 
So the concept of Jackie Winter Waters was to provide the essentials of shelter, somewhere to cook, somewhere to bathe and somewhere to rest. And with the minimal budget in mind, and it being mostly for short-term accommodation, we stripped away the unnecessary elements of a typical house and created a single internal volume. It has a high pitched ceiling that creates space for a, a little mezzanine that sits over the top of the kitchen and the bathroom. The form of the building is also kept very simple. Um, so it's a single pitched roof optimized for future solar panels facing north. It also um, provides shade to the outdoor deck during summer and collects rainwater for the house and firefighting use. And then the roof form simplicity also reduces the stance, um, the chance of leaf debris accumulation on the roof. And the driveway in the foreground here also acts as a fire break between the house and the forest. So while all the external surfaces of the building had to be non-combustible, uh, metal wall cladding options were cost pro prohibi prohibitive um, due to the house being 100 metres within breaking surf. So many after many hours of research, um, the most suitable cost-effective cladding for this project was the James Hardy cement sheet cladding. Um, and this allowed us the exterior of the building to be painted in this playful camouflage by artists who are represented by Jackie Winter Art Agency. And this created a really nice, meaningful connection to the client and also a talking point for the local community. Um, the, we also used um, Rylock Bal 40 aluminium frame windows, color bond ultra metal, ultra metal roof sheet and um, perforated Corten steel as an innovative deck material over a steel substructure. Um, as a contrast to the robust external materials, we used a whitewashed uh, radiata pine plywood for the interior walls, floors, and cabinetry. And this reduces the visual clutter of the interior space. We've just used a simple strap join detail that harks back to the uncomplicated interior detailing of beach shacks of the 1950s and 60s. Upstairs is a mezzanine for meditation and rest. And although it's a very small footprint, it has plenty of height and big openings with views um, to Wilson's Promontory. For cost effectiveness, we chose to use a simple timber frame construction with concrete free footings, um, continuous insulation, airtight vapor permeable wraps. We've got ventilated cavities behind the external cladding and the subfloor is entirely enclosed in the cladding as well. These are all really standard details that are simple to achieve yet provide, provide a high energy efficient building envelope that's also bushfire compliant. So through standard detailing of readily available and cost effective materials, we're able to build this house for approximately $250,000, which is about five and a half square um, thousand per square metre. This was achieved during the height of COVID lockdowns and when materials were quite scarce. And I believe, believe um, it represents really great value for money. The house is also available for short-term accommodation. So if anyone is interested in experiencing a house for themselves, you can book it on Airbnb or Ripper Ride. And you can also explore further on um, Jackie Winter Places website. Thanks. Thank you so much, Imogen, for that presentation. Um, I would like to now invite Nigel Bell to join us. So Nigel has been working closely with Renew to select the Beyond Bell case studies. He brings a wealth of experience with four decades working in the fire-prone Blue Mountains and has been a sustainability leader in the bushfire resilience field for more than two decades. He represents the Australian Institute of Architects on the three bushfire standards and has just returned from California and the west coast of Canada researching their wildfire fire building response. So if you in the audience have any questions for Nigel or Imogen about Jackie Winter Waters, please put them in the Q&A and we can start to get to them. So Nigel, I'll hand over to you to say a few words about the project. 
Thank you. Thank you. I mean, congratulations, Imogen. A very lovely winning appearance, great design that has an elegant simplicity. And for people in the audience, simplicity doesn't come that easily. It takes, you've got to work at it. You've got to simplify detail after detail. You have to reconcile a whole range of different materials and regulation. So you've done it extremely well. All the projects you're seeing tonight and in future Mondays had to be number one, sustainable. And we obviously wanted as much bushfire resilience as is humanly possible on a whole range of different building sites, different ecologies, different states and territories. So this particular one was literally the first one we received and we were delighted when we did <laughs> because it's out of the ordinary visually and no doubt from a livability viewpoint in terms of the way it addresses a very difficult site in that you can't go straight up from the beach to it by vehicle. You've said you had to move and drive around through the edge of the forest and so on. So it's a high level achievement. Let me ask you a few questions. Like, let's have a discussion, Imogen. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about the planning problem because you've said before, it wasn't even obvious when it was just pure bushland that you would get permission to build on that site. And then secondly, dealing with a very high bushfire bowel level. What's your yes. So uh, actually the client, Jeremy, purchased the land unconditionally before he even knew he could build a property, a, a house on it because it was just leftover land at the end of a, a subdivision that had never had a house built on it. So we couldn't, we didn't have access to the site even. So we had to cross through the neighboring property to get access to it originally. Um, and when he called me and told me that he hadn't got he hadn't actually done any research to see if he could build on it I was <laughs> nervous so my advice to him was to get a land survey first and engage a bushfire consultant and the bushfire consultant was amazing he just guided us through what was going to be the best um the best way to create a fire break where to put the driveway and where we could build our building so that could be in that sort of bow 40 area um and so that that sort of really gave us the sighting of the project the size of the project and basically what it could be <laughs> um and he actually is a town planner as well so he managed the process with cfa who's the um local fire authority and council negotiating on our behalf and the client's behalf um to get this project over the line for yes. us. Yeah. Because from a bushfire perspective, it obviously had a few difficulties that emergency access or egress and through vehicles was rather circuitous. You couldn't quickly escape. So that was obviously something that concerned us when we were trying to assess and evaluate. You did point out though, that in an emergency, you could uh, uh, hurry down, down slope straight to the beach you didn't have to come and go via the, the, the track running around the other properties. Although, of course, that made building more difficult. Yeah. Certainly, when it comes to cost, the, you did all the obviously good things in terms of a lightweight construction. You didn't have concrete um, used. You had bore piers and things that were efficient and effective in a sustainability sense, but also in a cost sense and then use lightweight materials to, to get everything on site. But what about your core 10 uh, cheating? Because typically anything that's not stock standard that you can't buy off the shelf at Bunnings costs much more. Mm -hmm. What's your comment on that? Because it's not, you couldn't buy your sheeting at Bunnings, at least the, the floor <laughs> decking rather. Well, we bought it from Rapid Perf, who have sheets of um, any aluminium, mild steel stainless steel and core 10 um that they can press in whatever perforated pattern you like um so uh it actually being a sheet material it was quite cost effective and easy to to use on this site um they come in 1200 by 300 uh, three meter long sheets so we designed the the deck to be 
to suit the size of the sheets. Um, and that way it was really easy to, to build on site. Um, the core tan itself, um, yeah, it's actually not that difficult to come by or, or find um, once you've done the research. Um, and Perhaps we should explain what core tan is. Oh yes, Cortan is a um, a steel that actually has it reacts with the um, sort of marine environment um, to rust, have a rust. Um, I'm not explaining it very well. It's, it's brass rich steel. Oh, there we go. Nigel knows what he's talking about. That deliberately um, allows it to rust. So it goes from the usual black steel, depending on whether you throw a bit of mild acid on it or just leave it to naturally discolor. The color starts off as a beautiful orangey reddy brown, which might have different patterns on it, depending on what happens. Eventually it grows over years to just being a very neutral, darkish red brown but yes it's an interesting material and it only took one day for it to turn that color in its, in its you were close to the surf <laughs> yes exactly sure <laughs> last, last question uh, Imogen before we move on is obviously about cost because that's the key thing we're considering here and yours is one of the most cost effective a it's very small b you look very consciously at materials and how to get them on site and there's a builder on side to put it together well all important criteria the key difficulty now is your building is what three years old at this yes. point in time uh yes yeah because yeah. general building costs have gone up at least 25 percent in that time maybe more in some jurisdictions so you know, my, my comment is that we all Australia wide need to be very conscious that the prices of two, three, five years ago are not what you can build for today, unfortunately. And it's nothing to do with anything about except macroeconomics and how building costs along with too much other factors in the, in the lifespan of us and our materials, they've all gone up. So perhaps to finish from my viewpoint, I just say once again, uh, a lovely project, the artwork on the outside that you selected the colour palette for, I understand? Well, I advised on it not being fluoro colours, please, and to blend in with the um, local environment. Um, and anyone who knows Jackie Winter Agency knows that they love fluoro pop colours. So they were a bit sad that they had to... <laughs> Do muted colors but what i loved they loved what they came up with it it's really beautiful and it is a camouflage with the natural environment but then it's also this very cheeky um yeah pe person picking out from the trees it works brilliantly well done <laughs> thanks um thank you imogen we've had a fair few questions and there's a lot of interest in your build um, I might just throw a couple, we've got about five minutes, so I might just throw a couple of questions from the audience over. Um, was the access and the high bell rating the main reason for the relatively high square metre um, cost? Um, uh, that's a really good question. I think the high square metre cost comes from the fact that it is so small, but it still has to have a kitchen. It still has to have a bathroom. It still has to have all the trades come to site um, that you would need for a 100 square metre house or a 200 square metre house. Um, it still needs hot water service, water tanks. It still needs, you know, all of those sorts of things. So even though it's very compact, those things kind of push up that, um, yeah, that sort of square metre rate and bushfire uh, detailing is always going to make it yeah a bit more expensive we did get a qs um a quantity surveyor to tell us how much they thought the building was going to be built for and we actually built it for less than, than what they thought <laughs> um which was That's rare. good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um did that answer the question <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's always a piece of string kind of question, isn't it? Like it where, is. the costs, where the costs are going to yes. come from and where you can make restrictions. I was interested actually in what you said at the beginning about getting the assessor. So is that a standard recommendation for people in certain areas that you get a, what are they, a bushfire assessor? A or? bushfire consultant. I, I would highly recommend that. And they're professionals. They deal with it on a daily basis. And they have personal relationships with the council and with CF, the, the fire authority. So they're dealing with this day in, day out. I wouldn't like to do a project in a bell um rated area without one i think mm, absolutely i'd suggest because i mean your initial diagram showed how you deliberately consciously cited it to get away from the, the highest bowel level and that saved many tens of thousands of dollars just in cost because you weren't right in the middle of flame zone we'll talk more about what the bowel levels mean just the higher and the extreme bowel levels means that even the simplest building now, you'd pay more than 5,000 a square meter for, unfortunately. But yes, always when, if any doubt, or if you want to be certain up front, you get a bowel assessor before you go very far in your design or before you go very far in the siting of your building. Um, and on that tangent, there was a question about um, how to fireproof the underside of that house. if. If, is that a is that a concern? Oh, so uh, the cladding actually wraps right down to the ground, and so the subfloor is completely enclosed. Um, it also has an airtight wrap up behind the cladding that actually is um, underneath as well, underneath the floor plate. Yeah. Yes, you've really got two choices in that. You either take the walling all cover down to floor level or ground level. Um, as Imogen did. And then the fact she's got non-combustible decks is obviously another important factor. And if you look carefully at the photographs, whilst she has retained the low vegetation, the native vegetation, which is obviously important ecologically, there are no overhanging trees. Uh, the trees, which is one of the major things in terms of contributing to um, native trees that is, that burn so readily, that can contribute to the high heat intensity, have been deliberately kept away from the, the building site. And around the immediate building itself is the metal deck, again, would suppress a low level fire coming up to the building. So no, nothing's perfect, nothing can guarantee you'll be saved, but that was a very good, sensible response for bushfire. Um, and there's one last question I'll throw in on that one as well about um, vegetation clearance. So how far did you have to clear? Um, was vegetation clearance required for this project? And did they have to pay for vegetation offsets? Um, so we had to remove vegetation to cut in the driveway because there was no access. Um, and we had to clear vegetation where we have an on-site wastewater system and we um, located that along um, the sort of north boundary with the, the forest and that was part of the um, that was part of the fire break as well um, so yes there was vegetation that had to be removed um, and that kind of caused some issues because it was a very steep site it caused some eros erosion issues um, so we've worked really closely with the landscape um, designer to create rock walls um, and to, to um, sort of shape it so that stormwater that's running down from the forest above doesn't come down through underneath the house and things like that. Um, and then we've planted out the whole um, area with bushfire resistant low lying shrubs in and amongst the, the rocks. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Imogen. And I um, have a relationship to that part of the world. So I'm going to look out for it next okay. time I go down there. Um, all right. We're going to move on to our next case study. Thank you so much.
Um, so our next case study is with Thomas Caddy from Thomas Caddy Architects presenting on Rosedale Beach House number one. So based in the ACT and on the New South Wales South Coast, Tom works predominantly within coastal and bushland areas throughout New South Wales. His practice is strongly influenced by Australian landscapes, culture and conditions, creating architecture that is contemporary, yet has strong references to regional architecture styles and local contexts. Welcome, Thomas. I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project located in Rosedale uh, on the New South Wales south coast. Um, this project was a relatively small uh, 88 square metre beach house, uh, two bedrooms, two bathrooms. And it was built for quite a little bit under $500,000. Putting it in the uh, budget friendly uh, bushfire resilient building category, I, I think. Um, it's an interesting project in relation to this topic because not only was it um, built to the highest bushfire attack level of flame zone, uh, but also unfortunately um, it was uh, subjected to a, a bushfire uh, and put to the test during the 2019-2020 uh, bushfires on the New South Wales south coast. So uh, what I wanted to do was um, I'll show some images of the house itself uh, and then I have uh, some images just showing uh, the documentation of the construction and how we built it. And then last of all, I'll just finish with some images that were taken the next morning after the bushfires, uh, just as a reference to, to how it held up. Um, so this uh, was the frontage of the house, which uh, was deliberately uh, a very enclosed uh, elevation with quite small windows, but that was intentional. That wasn't because of the bushfire requirements. Um, and then once you moved through that, uh, that entrance, that's where we, we focused on having um, our windows and opening up to the outside. So there's, there's no reason that uh, you can't use like large expanses of glass in these even budget friendly uh, bushfire resilient homes. So we ended up with, this was about 2.4 metre high by about nine metres wide of glazing on that elevation facing the view. So it's more about just choosing where you want the, the glazing to go. This was the site when we first arrived and were introduced to the project, which I just wanted to show first. And next, I'll show this image of um, the site once it was prepared as an asset protection zone. So that was required in order to, because we were in flame zone, um, we, we also used a bushfire consultant and they required that the whole um, site be uh, maintained as an asset protection zone, what's called an inner protection area, um, which requires virtually clearing of all the undergrowth um, and some but not all of the trees. Um, being a budget conscious uh, project, we use uh, an off the shelf um, uh, steel pier and bearer and joist system this one was from span tech um, which they are cost effective and they go up very fast and it was a very simple floor um, and on top of that it was a pretty much a standard timber frame construction um, all of the structures timber except for uh, a few bits of steel used to achieve some of the larger spans this Next image is uh, quite good because it shows the flame zone um, roof construction that was required, which allowed us to use a timber framed roof, but on top of the timber rafters, we were required to use uh, tongue and groove plywood, and then you can build your battens and steel framed roof on top of that. Um, the cladding on this project was this CSR bare stone fibre cement, uh, which can be used to achieve uh, flame zone requirements, which is a 30 minute fire resistance level. Um, 
So as long as the wall's constructed in the right way, uh, it, it can achieve flame zone. And then we were also required to do bushfire shutters um, and we used roller shutters, uh, which we recessed up into the suffetes above. So um, that was just a small um, architectural move we chose to do, which meant that when the shutters were retracted, you couldn't see the head boxes or any part of the shutter. That's another image of that there. Um, this was it when it was nearing completion and complete. Uh, you can see that there's some um, vegetation left, some trees were allowed and uh, in this part of the, the coast, the burrowing palms, which you can see here, are actually uh, you're required to retain those. And this shows the uh, roller shutters retracted up into the suffete. And now, it won't be much longer, but I'll just show a few images here of uh, uh, taken the very morning after the fires. Um, and so, all of the houses on the street burnt down, that, except for one, um, well, some at the very start of the street didn't burn, um, where it connected onto another street. Uh, and one other house that was built to Bell 40 also survived, interestingly. Um, so fortunately, the, the, the owners were able to put the shutters down before they left uh, the week before. It looks, the landscape's quite different uh, following the fires, um, all of the undergrowth went. Uh, some of the trees have recovered, but not all. Wow. Thank you, Tom. That's quite incredible. Um, if you have any questions for Tom or Nigel about the Rosedale Beach House, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom, and I'll hand over to Nigel to say a few words about your project. Well done, Tom. A lovely project, and of course, it was proven to be highly successful under extreme circumstance. And of course, that's what, where the bushfire regulations are at. The main Australian one, first of all, there is planning, town planning. That varies across different states. And most states and territories have very specific requirements, which then say you may build or not build or in different areas. Past that, the regulations, for better or worse, jump design, which is your field and mine, and they're straight to the construction materials. So in your case, you've got, again, a small 88 square meter house with a very livable deck. You've got a very nice outlook. You've designed for sun. And again, you've got lightweight materials that effectively could withstand the heat, the intensity and the burning embers, where what looks like from your image, a standard brick veneer house next door, that didn't survive at all. So what, what are some of the key things you, lessons you've learned from that? What would you do differently if you were doing it today? Anything, nothing? I don't know if I'd do anything differently, but what I, what's become apparent to me is um, the smallest measures uh, made the biggest difference, I think, with, with this house um, and, and with the building for bushfire um, resilience. Uh, and the main one being just sealing up the gaps. I think the house next door, it was a brick near, but um, mainly, it, I think it, those types of houses burn down because embers get in. So the key thing is to like seal up all of the gaps, which isn't a very costly uh, exercise. It's, it's a little bit fiddly. There is some cost. You know, the builders whinge about it a little bit when they're building the roof. But um, uh, aside from that, um, sealing up the gaps and sealing up the windows, is re they're really the main, uh, the main contributors, I think, to, to the resilience in this case. Yes. I mean, of the different fire actions on buildings, first of all, you've got 80 to 90 percent of house losses typically come from burning embers. And those that could be leaves, it could be twigs carried often kilometers away from the main fire front. It can go sideways with an eddy of wind or it could be 10 kilometers ahead of the fire front. 
So protection against embers by, as you said, sealing gaps and cracks, making sure doors, windows are closed. If you have shutters, you close them and protect as much as you can. And of course you need to protect people. So that's embers. That kind, your kind of house there also had flame, radiant heat, and then some flame contact. You can see that from the slight discoloration of your bare stone walls, but it survived at all because you designed and built it to the Australian standard 3959. One difference though, is that when you built that back 2018, uh, you were allowed aluminium shutters over windows but that's no longer the case because aluminium, the melting point, or should we say the point where it loses strength is only 450 or 500 degrees. And a good bushfire will jump to 700 degrees or more in the first 15 or 20 minutes. So these days there is a number of different ways of doing bushfire shutters, but they have to be stainless steel is, is the, short, <laughs> the short version of that. Or if they're barn doors, that swing like that, again, they're heavy duty steel. Aluminium is no longer accepted within bushfire prone areas as a material. But what would you say about the Hebel uh, AAC, perhaps if you explain what that is, and then your underfloor structure, which was left open to fire. It's, you have exposed galvanized steel and the last project they filled it in, but your project, let the steel exposed with then Hebel. Could you explain? Yeah, that's right. And, and I think one of the things that, that we need to do is, is build to the requirements and build for resilience, but also um, we're still practicing architecture. So we still have to build the right thing on the site. And so for me, I really wanted this floating elevated lightweight look to the house. So carrying the cladding down to the ground wasn't going to work for me. So what we did instead was we had a, a steel um, floor framing system and we used Hebel, we used the power floor system, which is a 75 millimeter thick um, aerated concrete planks. And we laid those over the steel subfloor. Um, and that gave us our fireproofing of the underside of the house. Um, now, I, in, in subsequent projects, I'm not doing that anymore because it didn't really allow me to get enough insulation in, even though we got enough insulation for that project, it passed the, the, the energy rating, but you can, you can achieve uh, better energy rating if you insulate a little bit more under the floor. Um, and so in, in future projects, I haven't done that anymore. And also uh, with the steel subfloor structure, um, steel piers effectively in our flame zone, um, we're finding that the certifiers are more and more, well, less and less accepting of that. And I found that in my most recent project, um, we had to take further measures on top of our steel piers to protect them yes. in order for the certifier to accept it in a flame zone area. Yeah, so again, that isn't written into regulations, but it comes back down to the the a professional who is certifying and saying it passes. In one of the projects in my area, uh, the building was finished. It rested entirely on some heavy steel uh, supports. And right at the end, the certifier would not give the occupancy certificate until they then wrapped in a fire rated material, all the bits of steel. So this is, if you like a new twist or a new development on the, regulation and the industry that certifies wanting more assurance that the thick thickness of steel, the, the um, capacity of the steel can withstand the intense heat, uh, in your case, fire coming up at ground level, as well as the canopy fire overhead. So yes, um, for those listening, it's something you now have to be aware of because what was approvable in terms of aluminum shutters no longer, and what has been approvable up till very recently and exposed steel is now highly questionable whether you'll get an approval. Yeah, I, I actually wouldn't um, design to that at, at any more in flame zone just because uh, of the fear of it not, not passing. And, and I have actually switched to using uh, masonry piers 
underneath. Yep, mm -hmm. yep fair enough. Um, Hebel is aerated autoclaved concrete, AAC. And for those that don't know, it's basically you can buy it in block form or in panel or sheet form that Tom used and uh, different thicknesses. So it is a very lightweight material that is made by using cement and sand and then additives. So then it chemically reacts to almost being like a pumice stone inside a mold. So yes, it is good, well, reasonably good insulation. It's only 75 mil thick, mm -hmm. um, but very fire resistant. So it, it's one of the suite of materials you can use, but like all these things, there's positives, but there's also a few negatives here and there too. Thank you, Tom and Nigel. We have a couple minutes for questions. Um, I was curious about the uh, the budgetary constraints on this project because you hadn't listed um, too much on that. So can you give some indication on, I guess, where it's at in the, in the client's budget and or? square meterage and or what would you change yeah look interestingly um uh so it was yeah kept as small as we could um due to a constrained budget um uh and so 88 square meters for around about 475 or 480 is um is almost bang on that five and a half thousand per square meter mark um so that's quite interesting that that seems to be the number at least back then, for a uh, a small, um, yeah, house with some bushfire re resilient um, sort of uh, inclusions, but um, yeah, as as Nigel was saying, it's it's I think it's a lot more now. I've had projects um, where we've had quotes for flame zone steel shutters, uh, where the steel shutters alone come to a hundred thousand and more. Um, uh, but they are the main that they, they are definitely the main cost uh, in a flame zone construction but um mm. yeah yes you guys have got the choice basically of going straight for flame zone tested and approved windows and glazed doors of which there's very limited choice or the more common route often a bit cheaper but not much is you have a bow 40 window or door and then a flame zone shutter over the top because of course, as you alluded to, Tom, um, you need the shutter beat down. If a fire comes through, there's no point being in Sydney uh, or away at your workplace and the yeah. shutters aren't down when they're most needed, when you spent so much money hoping <laughs> they'll never be tested in that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly found that um, at least back when we were designing this project that the flame zone rated windows were very limited uh, and they, the expensive ones were the ones that open, so fixed windows were reasonably affordable, probably even cheaper than using shutters. But once you have openings, they, the prices tended to go up. But hopefully over time, as we're all building to these higher standards, the market will deliver um, you know, sort of lower prices on this. Yes, indeed. All right. Um, thank you. We'll come back to this um, project and other projects at the end in the panel. But thank you, Thomas, for bringing us your presentation. I'm going to move into our last case study, um, which is with Kirsty Wolf presenting on the Bell Flame Zone Hempcrete House. So Kirsty's journey in the realm of design was ignited by a fascination with natural building materials and a passion for sustainability. This took her down a path of innovation and led her to become one of the leading proponents of hempcrete building in Australia. Based in the high bushfire risk area of the Blue Mountains in the New South Wales, she has specialised in creating buildings that are not just aesthetically pleasing, but are also resilient in the face of Australia's high bushfire risk. Her unwavering commitment to sustainable and functional design, as well as her blend of artistic flair and technical expertise, has resulted in spaces that not only captivate the eye, but also enhance the lives of those who inhabit them. So I'll hand over to you, Kirsty. Thank you very much, Rachel. And uh, I'll just start uh, and share my presentation. Just... Thank you. Well, tonight I'll be talking to you about a Val FZ Hempcrete home. It's uh, in the Blue Mountains. I'm also based in the Blue Mountains on the lands of the Darak and Gundungurra people. Uh, this project is located uh, actually just across the road from the Blue Mountains National Park. As you can see, the green arrow is indicating this block of land. 
Uh, it is on the street. Across the road is the Blue Mountains National Park and their bushland extending for a uh, extensive uh, area. And in fact, during the 2019 fires, there was backburning in that area to prevent the further spread of fires, but that backburning went right up to across the road from this property, um, as you can see in the other photo um, on the screen. So one of the first things we looked at in terms of bushfire resilience was placing the property far back on the site as far as possible away from the high bushfire risk of the national park because that was land we couldn't manage so luckily uh, it's a quiet cul-de-sac and so instead of having a, a large backyard it in fact has a large front yard but that also creates part of the asset protection zone for the property on this particular property, north was uh, to an angle and unfortunately there were some trees in the neighbour's yard. Um, but in order to take advantage of the winter sun, um, being Blackheath, it gets quite cold in winter. Uh, so we have an, an L-shaped property with large decks facing to the north. Uh, you might note that there's uh, three large water tanks and that's because uh, this property uh, does not have town water and has to both collect all of its own water for drinking and using. Plus it also needs to have 5,000 litres available for uh, firefighting. So the unique things about this house, are basically it's quite a small property. Um, as we've discussed earlier, that actually means that sometimes per square metre, it can be high, higher than a larger property because you have all the same services whether you have a large house or a small house, you still need kitchen, bathroom, laundry, connection to services, all of those sorts of things. But in terms of both resource use and budget, one of the best things you can do is build a smaller house. But probably one of the more unique things about this is that the walls of this house are made from hempcrete. And one of the great things about hempcrete is it's non-combustible. And so you're getting that non-combustibility. It's not a special material that you need to use in a bushfire area. That is just one of the properties of the materials. So uh, the great thing is also that hempcrete relates really well to standard construction. So inside the hempcrete walls, there is just a standard timber frame, but that is protected because uh, the hempcrete walls are cast around that timber frame and provide uh, protection from any flame contact and radiant heat by covering that timber frame. As you can see, uh, a formwork is held out from that timber frame. Uh, it's filled with the hempcrete, then removed, and the house is finished with a render finish. So as well as being non-combustible, one of the great things about the hempcrete is that it also insulates uh, against radiant heat in a bushfire, also very good insulating your house, um, to keep you warm in winter and cool in summer. Another great thing about the use of hempcrete is that particularly with this cast on site method is that it's naturally gap free. There's no junctions between the walls because it's all cast in one section. So uh, on this case, it's on a concrete slab. So um, no gaps between the concrete slab and the walls. You need to detail the uh, around the windows and the roof and that way you have a, a very ember-proof house. Uh, in this particular case, the windows uh, were uh, timber windows, which may seem kind of surprising for a um, flame zone house, um, but they are from a company called Parhammer in Victoria, and they use a very dense timber called Manning Man 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 Caldra, um, and that's actually been tested for flame zone. So a couple of the reasons the owners wanted to go with those windows is that if they use shutters, there's always the risk that a bushfire would come uh, when they were not home. So with the uh, power hammer windows, um, you get the beautiful aesthetic of the timber, but also don't have to worry if you're not home uh, and uh, it's a bushfire is approaching the house. In terms of the budget, um, the project was a cost of $450,000. Uh, 
for uh, 90 square metres. So that worked out at 5,000 a square metre, which is very uh, consistent with the other small projects which have been featured tonight. Uh, certainly one of the higher um, cost items was the uh, timber windows. So in terms of the hempcrete, um, the great thing is when building in flame zone is that it's actually no different to build a house to flame zone using the hempcrete than you would just a normal hempcrete wall. So it gets the benefits of being non-combustible, but all the great things being good insulation, it provides some thermal mass, it's vapor permeable, so that helps it to regulate humidity inside your house. You never get a buildup of condensation. It has uh, low embodied energy. In fact, it's uh, carbon negative and hemp is an incredibly fast growing crop with it being grown from seed to harvest in three to four months. Um, the other great thing about the hemp is that it's also compatible with conventional building uh, and it's also very uh, low toxic and very healthy and creating healthy indoor air. So in terms of looking at sort of the non-combustibility of the hempcrete, um, we have here a blowtorch test uh, where they've got a block of hempcrete. So you can see that uh, the thermal imaging is showing uh, how high the temperature is at the front of that. But you can see that at the back of that block, it's just the uh, ambient temperature of 25 degrees. And not to, not to always trust all the science, I in fact did my own sort of half hour um, blowtorch test on a block of uh, hempcrete and was able to uh, certainly replicate those results. So the hempcrete is then finished with uh, two coats of render. So we have here just showing that's the, the house with the hempcrete done and uh, down below we have the uh, first coat of render. And uh, then this is the, uh, the finished product. Um, so a very attractive, uh, natural looking house. Um, and yes, while we can't use timber on the outside, uh, they have been able to sort of, apart from the windows, uh, used it extensively on the inside um, and the ceilings. And uh, one of the great things is that they wanted a timber look deck. Um, we had to use uh, non-combustible materials. So obviously timber was out of the question. Um, but used fibre cement sheet for the deck and finished it with some wood look tiles, um, which actually came up really fantastic. Um, so if people are interested uh, in learning more about uh, hemp building or are looking at building with hemp themselves, um, they can go to hempbuilding.au, which is a directory of um, hemp building um, suppliers and professionals, uh, and it's all Australian based. Um, that's it. Thank you, Kirsty. That was a great presentation. And uh, if you have any questions about Kirsty's uh, fireproof hemp house and you want to put it into the Q&A, you can do so now. I'll hand over to Nigel. Thank you. Uh, my image isn't appearing, not that it worries me. Oh, there I am. <laughs> okay. Uh, look, well done. Um, Kirsty is one of the developing experts on hemp building, and uh, you explained it very well in that you're able to use pretty much standard building construction techniques, but then you've got the combustible timbers encased within this highly sustainable, highly bushfire resistant, high um, insulative value material. So, um, can you tell us, Kirsty, did you have trouble in terms of getting the right tradies to do the hemp work as distinct from the standard timber framing? What, what was the story behind that? On this particular house, the, the owner and a friend of his actually did the hemp walls themselves. Um, so I actually was on site for a day with them and um, basically trained them up. Um, but they the builder who was conducting the, the rest of the build has actually worked on uh, three other hempcrete builds in the Blue Mountains. So knew exactly what was needed in terms of the, the bracing and the installation of the services to make the, the, the installation of the hemp uh, easier to do. Mm. Because you've got to put your uh, electrical conduits and your water pipes in the wall, don't you? Buried in the wall um, as the hempcrete uh, goes up within the formwork. 
Yeah, so it's it's actually not too much different to uh, a standard build in the sense that we run all the services through the frame. And in that way, by comparison to a lot of other natural building materials such as straw bale or mud brick, where you really have to think very carefully about where and how you place your services, uh, using hempcrete, it's a lot more um, relatable for, for trades and a lot more closer to uh, conventional building techniques. So, but you're also saying that you're now starting certainly in Blue Mountains and no doubt elsewhere, you're getting builders who are practiced in it. And that obviously uh, makes it easier in, in a practical sense. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons behind having the hemp building directory is so that if people are looking at building out of hempcrete, they can actually find builders and practitioners who are familiar with that material uh, in their area. Hmm. So how did you go with approval? Because anything that's new and innovative often has multiple barriers put in front of it. Firstly, for the National Construction Code, more typically called the BCA Building Code, that it's not a material named in the Building Code for deemed to satisfy. It has to go through an alternative approval process. And then secondly, when it comes to bushfire, again, materials uh, products are meant to be tested to the special Australian standards for BAL 40, which is 1530.8.1, or BAL Flame Zone 1530.8.2, a very specific fire test, which is more than just what you showed of a, a blowtorch on a bit of material. So, what, absolutely. What process? Tell us about it, please. Um, in terms of that, if I can actually just uh, share my screen briefly for a moment, um, two of the more popular sort of uh, hempcrete binders in Australia, um, one of them actually has Codemark certification. So they've actually got a, a 60 minute fire rating. Um, and so that more than re makes the, um, uh, that, that sort of more than covers the 30 minutes required for uh, BAL FZ. Uh, the other bind has only been tested up to BAL 40, but if they did carry out testing to um, Flame Zone, I've got no, no doubt that they, they would um, reach that. So at the moment, uh, the Codemark certified product, obviously you can rely on that Codemark certificate, but most of the other hempcrete um, products are relying upon uh, performance solutions. Uh, which if you're buying a proprietary binder, the manufacturers will actually provide you with those performance solutions. Mm. Yes, performance solutions are great. They're the theoretical way you can gain approval. The key problem for industry, in particular designers and architects, is that does your client have the money to, to go there? Because unless there is enough uh, financial support, uh, it's very hard to get approval. Let me point out that for example I think though in this in this sorry in this situation where the manufacturer is actually providing you with that um performance solution that's that you're not actually paying additional for that that's actually part of their product is that they're providing that performance solution to you yeah and code mark is widely accepted by certifiers but yes. I was going to allude to the fact that trying to get earth construction straw construction took decades because, for example, I tried literally 30 years ago to get straw bale uh, rendered, and the comment was you need every single bale tested and approved. And, of course, you can't. And eventually it was a local Blue Mountains architect who used the building code where he used 90 millimetres of dense render over the straw bale, and therefore he could gain approval as of right because the way the building code was written, it didn't... It, declassified what was behind the 90 mil millimetres of dense render, you could have anything. So he was able to prove that therefore it could be straw to meet the regulations. So no, that's good. You've, you've been there, you've done that. And the, uh, it's now achievable more readily because you've got manufacturers and people who can help you tick boxes, which is unfortunately required when you're doing anything a bit different. So um, what about hempcrete cost you said overall about costs do you relate it to the cost of for example a, a cavity brick wall or what would a comparison be that people might understand um, I actually got into building with hempcrete by building my own hempcrete house uh, and when I did my house which was uh, back in 2000 and 
2012 to 2014. Um, but I did some comparisons against sort of published costs at that time. At that particular time, the hemp creek came in about the same as brick veneer. So it was cheaper than double brick, but more expensive than, um, than a clad building. I would say that since then, there's been changes dramatically in terms of building costs. I would say now that there is a bit of a price premium for building the hempcrete walls. Um, but one of the things you've got to have a look at is that your walls are actually only one small part of your building and they might be sort of say 12% of the cost. So if you're paying an extra 10% on top of that, in terms of the overall cost of your build, it's not really that big. But against that, you've also got to weigh the benefits in terms of reduced heating and cooling. Uh, hempcrete's really great at keeping really stable temperatures. And so it means that if you don't have to heat or cool your building at all or as much over the life of that building, there are really substantial savings. And also savings in terms of even uh, systems you need to put in. If you don't need to put in as large an air conditioner, um, as well as not using it as much, there's really ongoing savings there. So I think people have to start looking at longevity and the overall outcome of a building and not just the upfront costs. Sure, sure. Yes, it's a, the point of multiple benefits. And obviously, timber creeps a very interesting material in exactly that way. Hmm, well done. So, Rachel, do we have further questions? Yeah, um, well, I also had a question um, relating to that cost, Kirsty. So since we're looking at budget-friendly design, what are the ways with a particularly like a hempcrete build um, that you can reduce the cost? Is there ways that you can do some of the labour yourself? And are there people doing that? Yeah, look, in terms of that, I, I think that hempcrete is quite, uh, quite good in terms of do-it-yourself. Um, I would sort of say that if you are looking at doing it yourself, certainly um, go along and do a workshop or work on another build or get someone who is um, skilled to oversee and supervise things because but with good supervision um, owner builders or volunteers or friends can actually do quite a quite a good job it's not heavy work uh, the hemp fiber itself is quite light um, you do have to be very careful about your um, occupational health and safety uh, because the lime that is used is caustic. So it's gloves and long sleeves um, and uh, PPE equipment uh, to be used. But in terms of uh, owner builders being able to do it, yeah, look, it really is doable. Having said that, uh, professionals, I'd sort of say for uh, one professional can do the work of about three uh, unskilled people. So Certainly, uh, the professionals will do it a lot faster, but if you've got plenty of time, it really is quite doable for owners to do it themselves. And would you be using uh, cement mixers or what's the process? What do you mix it in and apply it <laughs> within the formwork? Yeah. Uh, generally, a cement mixer is not, not ideal because a cement mixer relies on the uh, mix getting to the, the top of the mixer and falling down. But hempcrete is very light and very sticky. And so it doesn't have the slump that, that concrete does. So generally, um, people will be using what they call a pan mixer or a mortar mixer, um, quite often used by tilers to mix up their mortar. So it's a flat mixer with paddles that go around. Um, and, and you can get smaller ones from higher companies. Um, there are various sort of uh, uh, people now who are hiring out sort of larger ones. So Certainly they are available and if, if people want to get hold of one, great thing might be to get onto the Hemp Building Australia Facebook page and uh, put up a question and I'm sure someone will help you out. Oh. But again, the key thing you mentioned, because you're working on something powdery and dusty and then you're using lime, you have to be very careful both in what you do or don't inhale, but also things like goggles because one of the uh, better earth building contractors putting in lime render have been permanently blinded in our area just from tripping with a with a bucket of lime and it just splashed in his eyes he's entirely out of business as a result so just again care is needed on those products absolutely absolutely so um all the time looking out for um your personal protective equipment and and safety and making sure that everyone's aware of the risks on a building site absolutely sure 
But again, an excellent project. It's already been featured in Sanctuary magazine. How long ago? A year ago, was it? Where again, the technical is there, as well as now in the uh, website set up for uh, to do with this uh, set of webinars. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will um, invite all the panelists back and we're going to start to open up the chat. And I will also acknowledge that, yes, you can find all of these um, case studies listed on the greenrebuildtoolkit.com website. So for all of the technical specs and the information and the pictures and a lot of the things that have been discussed tonight, I would suggest that everyone go and check out the uh, flash website that has had a lot of work put into it so we have about 20 odd minutes for a larger discussion um discussing budget-friendly bush bushfire resilient homes just a reminder to submit your questions into the q a function not the chat function because we are putting those q a questions to our panelists um so i will hand over to nigel well, which question <laughs> should we be answering first? Just what's in front of me is about the R, the resistance rating of hempcrete. Are you able to answer that, Kirsty? Yes, yeah, so at, at a 300 millimetre wall, which is what we used at the uh, Bell FZ, we got a 4.2 rating. So it's an R4.2, which is um, you know, well above what, what you need for current um, minimum standards. Mm -hmm. Thomas, uh, New South Wales, minimum R1.5. Uh, Imogen, Victoria, any minimum requirement on walls? I think it's R2.5, but I haven't done any R2.5 buildings for a long time. <laughs> okay, you do better than that, I yeah. take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure all of us in this panel discussion would because the cheapest quick fix you can get on any building is insulation value maximizing it costs you so little yet it makes a fundamental difference to life in inside the building for his human comfort but also longevity you know the cost is paid many times over within even one or two years most likely so yes um any comment about just thomas um sorry about insulation yes what values would you normally use or it's it's so it's so different in the different areas because um, I work in the ACT where it's a similar sort of client to Blue Mountains, but I also do a lot of a lot more work in New South Wales uh, and um, down the coast uh, where where that house was at Rosedale. The climate's very benign; like that, that house is very rarely closed, uh, and it doesn't have any heating or cooling. Um, other than a ceiling fan. So it relies on its insulation and just solar passive design. Um, and even with that uh, heaval as the only insulation in the floor, um, we got quite a lot of insulation in the walls and in the roof and that kind of like balances it out. But you just, you wouldn't get away with that up in the ACT or, or in your area in the Blue Mountains. So it has a lot to do with, with, with exactly where you are in New South Wales. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, I think with the Hebel flooring, we got Hebel flooring with a battened timber floor over the top, we got a total of R1. So that's, that's it's not much, but we had 140 studs for the timber framing. So we fit a lot of insulation in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously the amount of insulation totally depends upon where, we, where you are in Australia and what, what the climate is, because mm. Tom's uh, lovely, uh, building was close to the water near beaches. It was obviously getting cooling breezes, uh, as was Imogen's to, to a large degree, where Kirsty's is more inland and arguably a far more severe climate. As you said, comparable to that of ACT or um, perhaps parts of Tasmania, a genuine cold temperate climate. So another question here about is rammed earth wall still a bowel option? I know, but anyone else want to make a comment? <laughs> in, in terms of the non-combustibility, yes, but you might be having a harder time trying to get it to pass the thermal requirements um, in terms of, because a uh, rammed earth wall is all thermal mass, not very much insulation, probably an R value of 0 0.5. Um, so while they work, it's very hard to actually get them to pass through the current regulations. I just noticed in the chat, there's a question about sort of, uh, could hempcrete go inside 
uh, rammed earth because typically now in order to get rammed earth to pass the insulation requirements they're putting polystyrene in the middle of it mm. which for me um, takes away many of the benefits of rammed earth in terms of vapor permeability and natural materials the answer to that is yes absolutely you could put some hempcrete in in the middle of your rammed earth um, however polystyrene does give you a higher r value than than hempcrete um, but rather than putting it as a sandwich between your rammed earth, you could actually use it on the outside of your rammed earth. So you could use your rammed earth as your um, structure so you don't need a timber frame and put your layer of hempcrete on the outside. So therefore, you've got your thermal mass on the inside of your building where you need it and you've got it insulated on the outside. It's what you're talking about is some commonly called reverse brick veneer in that you've got your insulation and then you've got your thermal mass. The idea of putting earth and also hempcrete, that's a, a lot of material. There are, I suggest, with respect, easier ways of doing it. Um, certainly 90 millimetres of dense render is enough to get you a very high bushfire rating. But as Kirsty correctly said, you get a very low uh, R for resistance for insulation. So yes, um, you can vary the R rating with earth by again, using lightweight components, including you know, various kind of organic materials in the earth, but you never reach the minimum requirement easily. So yeah, effectively so much earth construction has typically polystyrene and then effectively two, two bits of wall because you've got polystyrene down the middle and it's pinned across to hold the two outer, outer uh, bits of wall together. So yes, that can be done. But certainly what the principle for temperate climates is what Kirsty said, you're trying to keep the inside thermal mass warm or cool according to the season and even out the day night or the week by week temperature fluctuations. So there's ways of doing it. I might just I might just bring our discussion back for a minute back to uh, cost and budget friendly tonight. So I'm going to ask the panel, considering there are limited bell rated materials used under the standard three nine five nine, what tips do you have for reducing material costs overall and for keeping them reasonable? Do you want to go, Imogen? Um, yeah, sure. So for our project, we had to find the most cost effective cladding material and that was um, the cement sheet from James Hardy. Um, it being a sheet material, it was really easy for, for installation as well. Um, and it does need a paint finish, which was adds to the cost of it. And that's why maybe um, the bare stone that Tom used is might be more cost effective. I'm I'm not sure, sure but the idea it's not, was it's not okay. It, it, it's so much more expensive than okay. the uh, than the uh, paint, the ones that require painting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, true. And we wanted to have this mural um, as part of the the building for us, so it's kind of important that we could have a paint a paintable um, finish. But yeah, I would say anything that's readily available and in sheet materials and you can design to minimize wastage of those materials um yeah it would be my my advice to cost effect that's really what you're saying Imogen you design to the module uh, of those panels and right. do your dimensioning around that and again if you can design to standard window sizes and door sizes you're ahead financially true yep hmm. Tom did you have anything to add to that um well I suppose on um cost effectiveness of of, um, of of sort of wall cladding materials that perform well in a bushfire. We talked about brick veneer, you know, not working next door to, to the house that I did, but it wasn't because of the bricks. I think bricks actually perform quite well. I think you can get a, a 30 minute fire resistance level, which is what's required in flame zone just from a standard brick veneer wall. So it's more about um, the junctions of where your brick wall meets your windows and where it meets the the eaves uh, and making and and plugging up uh, weep holes and all of those sort of um, penetrations that brick walls often have. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It's the most basic material of all, which is just brick veneer wall, will actually perform quite well as far as fire. 
um, but it's not always appropriate uh, for for your project. In, in the case of my project, there was no way I was going to do a brick veneer construction on that site. So um, I think it's about finding the the appropriate material um, that's right for your site and your design, and and then looking at, at what needs to be done to uh, to achieve the fire protection. But a fire resistance level of thirty minutes isn't hard to achieve compared to a lot of uh, you know high rise construction. They they talk about fire resistance of two hours on their their wall systems. So thirty minutes is pretty easy. And Kirsty, did you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I'd say windows. Now, particularly if you're in, in flame zone and even um, in sort of Val 40, windows are going to be one of your most expensive items. And so when you're looking at your windows, thinking really carefully about making sure that every window that you're putting in is really working for you. So looking at the orientation of the window, um, the outlook from the window, what is the window doing? Is it view? Is it light? Is it ventilation? But really carefully considering every single window um, and not putting in putting in windows that you need and that you would, will actually add delight to the building, but not putting in windows you don't need. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, the whole thing of just massive glass is not really affordable in most cases in a high or extreme bushfire area. I mean, Par Hammer was mentioned by Kirsty, the only company that allows timber windows to flame zone because they've had it tested with an imported timber. Um, and the starting point tends to be around three and a half thousand dollars a square meter. So you very quickly run into huge costs just for the windows and you might wait six, nine months or even a year to get them. So this is the point. Um, we have to look ahead very carefully in what we're doing and how we're doing budget, but also timelines. Thomas's and Kirsty's both for Flame Zone, and Imogen, you were at Val 40. Um, have you done anything further in Flame Zone? Have you noticed a difference in cost and difficulties? I haven't done anything in the Flame Zone. I've done Val 29 and 19 and Val 12.5. Um, not really. I haven't noticed because a lot of the detailing that we do for a bushfire that, you know, the wraps and the, um, the, the cladding and things like that, we do as standard a lot of the time anyway. So it doesn't actually, I mean, there's, there's additional complexities when you're, when you're doing it to the higher level, but I don't find that it increases the cost of the building much as yeah. Christy was saying before it's you know it's the cladding um that might be 10 percent or 12 percent of your project cost and it increases it by maybe 10 percent yeah yes up to bell 29 most common everyday building materials are not that expensive because they're common it's once you get to bell 40 there's a, a step jump in building cost and flame zone you can you know, go up double your cost depending on how you're building and where you're building. So um, as was explained by Imogen, not building in the flame zone, but moving your building back if you can out of that immediate region will save you many tens of thousands. So the upfront point of citing carefully. Tom, are you going to- Actually, gonna... yes, if I could uh, add to that, I, we had a recent project where we were told it would be certainly be a flame zone site by council and everyone who looked at it. Um, and then we even had, we had a bushfire consultant engaged and we met on site with the fire authority, which in New South Wales is the, um, the RFS. And um, they came out and said, yes, also we believe it's flame zone, um, but we took a punt and the bushfire consultant did some detailed modeling um, and they can actually do um, fire run modeling and it costs quite a bit of money. I think we paid about $5,000 for a report with some modeling. And in the end, he was convinced it was about 40 and we submitted that with our development application and um, it was approved as about 40 and the rural fire service agreed. So in that case, paying the $5,000 saved us well over a hundred thousand dollars 
Um, so sometimes the solution can be the, the fire consultants rather than the materials. Yes. Uh, I was going to say, I'd say that the biggest difference between the lower bell levels and flame zone is probably the roof detailing and the windows. Um, but if you are in a high bushfire area, I think you need to not just meet your minimum bell rating, but think about what is the what can I do that's most affordable that is going to be least combustible and sometimes where you can afford it exceed the minimum bell rating that you actually have and try and make everything as non-combustible as possible. Hmm. I agree. I should have perhaps said a bit more about the criteria in selecting these and the other high profile good projects in the when we were trying to um, define what makes defendable space what makes for landscape setting what are the qualities in in building that we need to look at in design and just very quickly what we came back with was defendable siting are you away from the bushland or in are you enveloped within it and then there were four different subsections about how close how far is there ways to access and egress in an emergency? Is there fuel reduction immediately around or under the building? Those kind of criteria. The second was in landscape setting. And obviously in some places like Kirsty's, it was a residential block, not much choice apart from moving it back. And both Thomas and Imogen's designs, again, very small constricted sites. So the setting about um, what was the, vegetation nearby was it low was it high was it dense was it flammable um, where were the tree canopies and so on and were there retaining walls or burnable things very close to the building thirdly water supply because hydrating the landscape is one of the fundamentals there's the famous case of the the one mulberry tree that saved a house in the middle of the forest that people love to quote because not only had people watered their lovely tree but they made sure that the water from the shower and the kitchen sink also supported it and the fire the flame literally just went around and continued on so there's a number of criteria about irrigation, water supply, having enough water for emergency supplies. The key one otherwise was about building design. And therefore, all of these projects exemplified simple form, low to the ground, apart from perhaps Thomas's somewhat, but cut in and certainly um, a simple building footprint that wasn't going to trap burning embers or the like. Exit entry, different directions if you were caught in the building at time of fire. Were the services protected? Were they underfloor, underground? Were they, were they accessible or not? What about passive house design or passive solar design? All of these houses consciously looked at one or the other. Passive house being the newer section to do with um, vapor control, moisture, controlling airflow using mechanical electrical systems. Passive solar is what's been done for thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of years, just siting your building to get sun when you want it and keep the sun out when you don't. So all of these projects exhibited one or the other to a very high degree. You should all be congratulated on your good design now. Materials of construction, yep, they are regulated, but Kirsty managed to get through finding the right supplier that had the tick the box answer when the when the going gets hard for a different material. Magnesium oxide board I see has just been questioned and Thomas you used that on your uh, floor decking didn't you? I seem to remember reading. Um, actually no not on that one that was just a standard uh, fibre cement. Oh it, it was the um, I don't make it anymore. Um, hmm. Well, I, can't, I can't remember the brand. It was one of the fiber cement ones, but it could have been one of the ones that had it, the magnesium oxide um, yeah, combined. Magnesium oxide board is very fire resistant, but you have mm. to be careful because one brand is off the market entirely because of the alkaline content and it was stripping the screws. So now you have to pre-drill and use stainless steel in fixing. So again, you've just got to be cautious about that kind of information and what you have.
I think we're I think we're getting very close to the end here, Nigel. We're gonna to have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Thank you very much for your summary of all of the builds. And I wanna thank our panelists very much for your time and your consideration in coming tonight and showing your work. It was very fascinating. So that's all the questions that we have time for, and you can view all of these case studies on our Green Rebuild Toolkit website. So I just want to tell everyone and remind our viewers, thank you so much for your questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't put them to our panelists tonight but you can get a lot of information on the builds themselves details and specs on the greenrebuildtoolkit.com so there are three more sessions in this series please join us next week for innovative bushfire resilient design where we will look at three more case studies thanks once again to Imogen Thomas Kirsty and Nigel for sharing your time and expertise and thanks to all of the attendees for tuning into this session and for the questions. We hope that this has been valuable for you in work moving towards bushfire resilient homes. Thank you and hope to see you next week.